Well, thank you so much, Ajita Prabhu, for coming all the way from Australia and sharing with us your experience with the Christian village. Um, we are going on to the, our next presenter, which also has an interesting study case. He has been leading here in the UK a project which is named the Ahimsa Dairy Foundation, and I think his main goal is to show how uh, it's possible to produce Ahimsa milk, and he has a huge list of people waiting for his Ahimsa milk. So he's going to share his experience with us as a study case. So I'd like you all to welcome Sita Ram Prabhu. I imagine we've talked on the phone, but I haven't actually met you before. Nice to meet you personally. Okay, so you need this. You have a presentation coming up. Okay, all right. Can I sit? something uh, called the Kuli Mela, and we take a very similar approach, really concentric circles of engagement. Uh, anyhow, um, and uh, I grew up at Sharnagadi, um, so uh, farming and the way devotees manage farms has been something I'm very aware of for a long time. Um, I've put a lot of thought into it, so when Sitaram first introduced me to the Ahimsa Dairy Foundation and his efforts there, I started to think, well, I've been thinking about these things and I've been silently critiquing these things for many years, um, so why don't I present to him um, the way I think we could approach it. Um, and that comes really from a perspective of um, the market exists, um, that self-sufficiency is through trade, um, and that uh, supply and demand um, is something valuable and important. But even more than that, uh, that really we need to be giving people a, an alternative to uh, slaughter dairy. Um, and uh, so it was really born out of that that we started to look at, at the numbers. So I'm going to present to you uh, 10 numbers, and, um, and we'll talk about it as we go along. And Sitran Prabhu will, will provide a bit more granular detail and anecdotes. Um, but I'm hoping these 10 numbers will help you understand the approach that we took and, and where we've gone. So the first one is uh, 10 years, um, so it's been running for 10 years, 7 years providing milk um, to consumers, um, which is, is quite an achievement, thank you. Um, and, uh, and it's been a long path, but um, uh, you know, if success is measured by survival, which I think in some ways it is, um, then 10 years is, is a measure of success. Um, but Sidram, if you want to tell us a little bit of where, maybe it's even longer, it's been germinating with you. Well, 2007, <coughs> 2007 was when we initiated the idea. And, um, and initially, actually, we were never thinking about producing milk ourselves. In fact, we were the man and we wanted to just to promote the whole idea of slaughter-free milk. But it didn't, people, when we started talking about it, people said, where's the milk? And the manor, which is where I was based, I've been based all these years, um, wasn't 
really able to respond in any substantial way. So we started to explore other 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 means, and so really the spirit. Uh, after, after the first two years when people started asking us, we really put our uh, hats on, we started to look at organizations um, who could help us or we could partner with, and it's been a learning curve, this quite a steep one, and it's, we've just sort of held on by our fingers and just pushed on through all thick and thin, and I think that's, for me, that's the key principle, that as devotees, we, farming's not easy in itself. Um, we, we had somebody else producing milk for us, we had all, all sorts of facilities, people, other people doing it, but every year, or every six months, something would break down. We'd have to take it up. So first it was deliveries, and then it was to the quality of the milk, and then it was this, and it was that, financially. So we just stuck through it, thick and thin, and Krishna was very kind, his lab was too. So really, I'm, I broke this section down into what it takes to, to last 10 years. You need partnerships on the path, and Sitaram Prabhu uh, uh, noted some of these. Um, so for instance, the, the first dairy that we had was with a partnership with a dairy called Common Work. So we had segregated cows, um, and those cows would come back to us, and they were part of our herd, and our milk supply was segregated. Um, but we utilized their understanding, expertise, and capabilities to get started. But it was never the intention to stay there. Um, we need people, we need dedication, determination, knowledge, and collaboration. So one of the things that I can observe um, is Sita Ram's determination and dedication has really held this together. Uh, you know, whatever numbers I could throw together would just disappear into the ether um, without going and being attached to somebody like Sita Ram. But at the same time, every time we have a meeting, we have knowledgeable people, uh, be they accountants or farmers or etc. So. Um, you know, really pulling together the right people, but you need some focus to put the energy behind it. Uh, and then the cows, you know, a sincere care for the cows, a plan for the, each individual cow, uh, and a plan for steady, sustainable growth. Uh, and my anecdote for this is anytime a devotee says to me that they want to get a cow, I say, so you're buying eight cows, because that was the ratio that I first worked out. And I'll talk about lactation periods and ratios, but Effectively, if you're buying one cow and you intend to have milk, you have a minimum of eight cows. So, um, yeah, just always keep that in mind. Um, so, uh, the community. So, uh, 2,000. That's our current community size. Uh, and what I mean by community um, are all the people who receive the milk, who are sponsors, members, on the waiting list. Yeah. But only 4% of those are directly related to ISKCON. So that is a very significant number, I feel. Um, that really using the core values that we have in ISKCON, actually we can appeal to a much larger population. And I'd like uh, Sitaram to talk a little bit about the markets because I think those are absolutely amazing. Um, so, and only 8% of our community actually received the milk. Uh, the rest are either on waiting lists or just happy to promote uh, this activity. So, <coughs> interestingly what we found <coughs> quite early on, well, well there were two aspects. One thing obviously is the price point was always very high and many people were prohibited by that. So there was a sort of a natural segregation as such. But I think at the heart of all of this is that we had a vision that was enthralling and it was something that resonated with many people. They wanted to make it happen. So. Even if they didn't get the milk, they were happy to support us to produce it. And, and the figures show, you know, out of the 2,000 people, only a very small number of, of the community, the ISKCON community. They were our best friends, but also sometimes our, our worst critics as well, as, you know, on many occasions. But um, the whole point was that um, we had a vision that could resonate with a much broader audience, and it started to grow and grow and grow. And it was that broader audience which has helped us to really even purchase our farm. And we last year purchased 48 acres of land. We hope by the end of this year to make it 72 acres. And it's really through people who resonate with our vision and really resonate with Prabhupada's vision. He, he came up with the, with the idea, but we've not perhaps packaged it properly. Um, in terms of our, our, our market or how it breaks down, uh, we have about, um, about 160 or 180 sponsors and sponsorship means that people sponsor a cow so we have on the website we have different cows 
and they sponsor you know three pounds, five pounds, or ten pounds a month. Uh, ten pounds a month. Then we have members, and members are the ones we've aligned to the vision of the project, looking at the long-term future, where we want to go, painting the picture of what we want to achieve. Um, and of those, we have 360. But now that we're entering a new phase, we're looking to increase that to a thousand members. And the, a member, membership is on several levels, but the, the key the key number is 90 pounds a month. Actually, it was funny because um, when I saw we we, we all heard about Casperacy. And when I first saw this, that they were asking for £108 for supporting their course, I thought, these must be devotees. I contacted them and found out actually they weren't, they were friendly, they were more broader community based people, <coughs> English, American. But I, I really always, I thought the fact that they had the, um, you know, the, the, the determination to do it, we, we adopted the same thing, £9 a month. So, majority of our members are, 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 are English or, or of the locality. Uh, we do have a broader congregation now in the UK, so we do have a number of congregation members, but majority are, uh, are that on that level. Then we have a few who are at £15, pounds, £30, pounds, or, or £1,000 a year. And that, that sort of you know, helps us smooth things out. Waiting lists. So this, this is the real key thing. We have a waiting list. I mean, we, we really didn't expect it, but our waiting list has increased to over 1,000. We had to we had to stop people putting their names down because we knew that we just couldn't reach so many people. And so um, our whole meditation right now is obviously to establish ourselves, but how to be how to um, create what I call nano dairies. We went to a, a team of us went to a conference a couple of years ago where they had micro dairies and nano dairies. Micro dairies, 10, 15 cows. Nano dairies, two, three cows. So. We, we were anyway. We, we, we were churning with. We we're trying to find a, a formula for going wider, reaching more people, um, but creating nano dairies. And you know, there's something incredibly powerful about being demand-driven rather than supply-driven. So we're not trying to sell people milk. They're trying to buy the milk from us, even at the price uh, that we're talking about. It reminds me of the. Uh, of the anecdote of having a smoking house or not having a smoking house, right? You take it away and suddenly the people who are still interested to come go up in quality and the people who are interested in our milk are interested in it with a passion, right? Uh, should, should we mention the price now? Or? No, it's coming up. It's coming up. Um, but uh, I really love the market stalls. So we go to just your basic English farmer's market and we have a Himsa milk there and it sells out pretty quick. Yeah, we have... Um we, do, we run two places, once a week in, uh, in northwest London, NW6, and another one in Islington in north London, twice once every two weeks. Um, normally, whatever milk we have for two days is raw milk, just straightforward, cool down. Uh, we, we ask £4.50 a litre at the, at the markets, and usually within two hours, we're finished. There's always a, people waiting to, to, to come. And now some people reserve a little earlier or something. So there's always a demand and people feel really disappointed if they don't get it. Now remember these people are not necessarily, uh, you know, coming back to Ajit's approach, um, they're not necessarily vegetarian. They're health conscious people, but they're, they, they love the ethic. And, you know, London has this pool of people who are really very ethically minded and they'll pay whatever's necessary to, to, to make it work. So majority are, are certainly not from the Indian community, and certainly where, where we always think that's the place to go, not from the Indian community, but from people who are often young and old, but very health conscious. So price is not the issue. We've raised that, we've put it there, so this is, this is one of the other numbers, five pounds. I feel like we gravitate towards that number, even uh, if, if we're not selling it, it exactly. You know, we have, we have a... Um, uh, a cost of delivery on top of the actual liter, and that's per liter. Yeah. So the normal price per liter is one pound. Our price is either three pound fifteen for um, sort of members, and uh, and four pound fifty. But you know that's a si significant number, and it, it absolutely requires having a pool of people who are uh, passionate about the values that we represent. Um, but that's what we're selling. We're selling a unique value, and that value. Um, is something that is very important to these people and to us, right? So uh, we, we embody that value as well as presenting that value. Um, we take direct monthly payments. This is another really important part. If you get a mobile phone in this country on contract, 
you are locked in for two years. And if you want to exit that contract, you have to pay the value of the contract to its termination. Now, a cow lives to 18 years. So if you have the benefit of the produce of that cow, really you need to think of yourself not as a one-time purchaser of some throwaway good, but as a part of that community and as a subscriber. And absolutely, we take subscription to our milk. We don't sell the milk individually. I mean, at the market stalls, it's a little bit different, but that's our outreach, and that's the tip of the uh, point, and that you know it, it has a different dynamic, but it's not the foundation on which our sales are born. Um, and, uh, and that price has to cover our pension, and it also has to cover the non-productive cows, right? which is very important. That goes back to that ratio. Right? If you have one cow, you actually have eight cows. In, in fact, I'll talk about the ratio that we found with extended lactation. But um, Another point, every single liter counts. We can't throw away any liters. So storing those liters as cheese or as yogurt or as ghee is a really important part of this. We can't, any milk that goes off is a lost value for us and is precious. Right? Every liter is absolutely precious. Um, there's not a big margin for wholesale. I, I said there's no margin for wholesale, and see Trump correcting me. There's 15p in it. Uh, it's not big enough for wholesale. Really, this is this is a direct relationship. Um, but the other way that we produce or, or get our leader out uh, is through the temple partnership and through restaurant partnership. Right. So there is a restaurant in Wales that takes our the Hemsa. What's the restaurant? It's the Cardiff Temple, and they have a Hemsa Cafe. The Hemsa Cafe takes our milk, and, and it's now an option on their menu. And for me, that's even better because now it's a smaller part of a larger price. Right. So it, it averages out, um, and people need to feel part of something that they can believe in. Um, so things like hand milking, natural insemination, organic bulls, cows, and cows all together. These are all important parts of the story. I should just mention on that, um, that um, you know, hand milking is hard work. And you know, we went through different phases. Initially, we, our, our hand milk is there, sending them there, smiling away. It's hard work. But we, we decided to go for the top standards. We were hand milking, organic, pasture fed, or fast, or not that. We, we, we wanted to get the height, and then people value that and then they will reciprocate. You know, some people say, you should be selling your milk at £7.50 a litre, and you'll, you'll still have custom. It's all about value, and, and you know, so we should do the best. Why, 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 why compromise? Just do it small and gradually grow. My, my economic head still has a slight bias towards <laughs> robotic milking parlors, but that's for a wider audience. <clears throat> so uh, here's four key numbers to manage, fly in the business. Uh, and these are the critical numbers. So, a two to four year lactation period. So when I first did the model, I was looking at a two year lactation period, and that's what was the one to eight ratio. Actually, we're approaching a sort of four year and counting lactation period. And, you know, there's some wonderful stories in there. My favorite is Jasmine the cow. Jasmine, and many temples around the world pass this, the, the Jasmine, she, she gives milk, but she's not had a calf and um, she's been giving a milk for about a year and a quarter now and uh, she gives how much now every day? Uh, five and a half litres. Five and a half. It varies a little bit more in the good weather, good grass and decreases a little bit in the winter but she, she's there steady as ever. And you know we know from Sasha that this is how the cows reciprocate um, and it's a, it's a wonderful story to tell the vegans. You do uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the vegan spectrum uh, they really don't like us but uh, on the left hand side of it they really love us. Um, so uh, we milked for between two to four years after calving. One cow is milking, who's never had a cow, that was Jasmine. Uh, the lactation period drives how quickly the herd grows, right? And we manage our herd for a balanced size. So that lactation period is the critical thing. Otherwise you get exponential growth, right? And we, we're looking for sustainable, manageable growth. The lactation period drives how many non-milking cows are in the herd. And we are neutral on cows and bulls <coughs> because we assume a natural distribution. So once you understand that about, you know, more than, uh, you know, 70% of your herd is not going to be productive, so there will be females in the overall Ahimsa herd who may never give birth or provide milk, and we're okay with that. And all the male cows, uh, male, uh, the bulls, are in that same bracket, right? But because we know there's a non-productive to productive ratio, 
actually they fit within the overall herd. It's not a problem, right? The numbers work out. So they are providing between four to eight liters on average per day, right? Now an industry standard with twice a day milking is 20 to 24. So that's a significant drop. We were originally hoping for around eight liters, but with the hand milking and, and not quite doing two milkings a day, it brings it down, but it can certainly be brought up a little bit, I think. Hand milking impacts the volume down. Sharing with the calves, of course we share our milk with the calves for a longer period of time than a normal dairy. Um, and breeding a selection of the milkers at two points in the year would help to balance this out. So the important thing is to, for a stable herd, you want those who are passing away to be balanced with those who are born, right? And having new cows in the herd brings up the lactation period for the cows that have just given birth, and then you have ones at the end of their lactation period, right, of our extended lactation who are low, but your overall average stays the same. And what you don't want is huge peaks. So you don't want to suddenly go breed 10 cows and then have it diminish over a four year period. What you want to do is two, two or four cows every year, and then what you'll have is a nice balance between one year, two year, three year, and four years of lactation. Um, and there's that key ratio. Our current ratio is 4.5 non-milkers for every milker, and that's 12 milkers. Ultimately, 12 milkers will support 45 non-milkers in the herd when we get there. And one of the benefits of starting a project like this is you get to start not where you're going to end up, right? So you get to start with a couple milkers and you get to start with you know whatever extended family they have. Ultimately, you know what size you're going to reach and then it will balance out, right? So cows live on average 18 years, so you need to balance against that 18 years life cycle. And um, so that, as I said, that ratio is driven by the lactation period and you need to balance between extended lactation, herd size, and milk averages. Right? That's the math, and it's pretty simple. So using oxen manure farming to increase overall income, right? So we deliver a box, which is our dairy. But one year we had agricultural produce at one of the locations we were at, and that was a big success. The more you can deliver in that box, why not soap, why not honey, why not any other kind of thing? You now have a, a market, you now have people who are engaged with you, and you can put more of your community efforts into that, and I'd like Sitaram to talk a little bit more about where they're going with that. Yeah, so um, really, in one sense, um, how I see it is that we, we, we've unwittingly or knowingly we've created our own village on a different level. At, <clears throat> at the center are the Ahimsa producers, so at the moment it's milk, but our honey man is here already, so next year honey will be on the offer. Our vegetable valley is just about to arrive, so next year we'll have vegetables. Uh, and then we'll start to increase our, our, our offer of other, you know, cottage industries. But already, under the Ahimsa umbrella, we have uh, a membership who are just waiting for anything that we produce. And if they don't get it, then we have a, a, a markets and other places where people, and restaurants, who may also take. So, in fact, I don't know if I mentioned before in one of these talks, but we had Selfridges approach us for our milk. In fact, they wanted cheese. And luckily, I mean, you know, we were certainly excited by it, but we were, we were, we were warned by somebody that, be careful. You know, once you're in the contract with somebody outside, you could be really, uh, it could be very detrimental. They'll fine you if you're not there, if you don't have enough milk, so forth, whatever. So we chose to say thank you, but no thank you. And we stuck with our base of customers, which was spread across the place, and it's really shown itself. We've increased our family of members, our village, and um, you know, we, well, whatever we produce, we'll have a market for. So that will allow, the, in, the, in this village, in the Hempstead village, whatever somebody has a strength for, uh, you know, whatever they produce, we'll have a market. And so that's how we will support livelihoods. That's our approach. So 140,000 and uh, uh, 50 is our uh, another two uh, key numbers here. So uh, we've delivered over the years 140,000 liters. Now we only average about 21, 22. When we're at full size, we'll average about 40, 45,000 liters a year. And then you can drive the, the maths from there. But um, I like to say that that's sort of 50 cows lives that we've saved. And that's 20 cows' lives indirectly. And when I say indirectly, if you look at the number of cows that are slaughtered, 
per 33,000. You just do the mass. Every year they have a calf, the calf is slaughtered, and then at the end of five, six years, they're also slaughtered, right? And how much milk will they produce over that period? So you get five cows per about 33,000 liters. So the fact that we've delivered 140,000 liters has taken that demand out of the slaughter market and put it into the slaughter-free market. So that's indirect cow's lives that we've saved. And then there's 33 cow's lives directly. That's our herd, right? And this sustainable demand-led growth. So from direct subscribers, not consumers, our growing demand list and our purposeful mission. And uh, 900,000, I needed a tenth number. Uh, just to make it nice and even. 900,000, that's the size of Nanda Maharaj's herd. And uh, you know, we're on our way. But uh, when we hit 900,000, we'll be, uh, and we'll celebrate. Good, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. are you having in the Ahimsa dairy at the moment? Sorry, what was the What breed of cows? Breed, breed of cows. Oh, uh, well, we had, I mean, we started um, at Common Work and they had, actually the original breeds they had were Montbellier, Swedish Red and Holstein Crosses. Um, and then we've introduced Brown Swiss. Um, now there's a lot of conversation about A1 and A2 milk. Uh, the Swedish Red, a few of our cows are A2. And we're working more and more towards focusing on that direction, or what I would call indigenous cows. Um, but yeah, those are the breeds. But are, are they fit for oxen work? Are you using the oxen for oxen work? Yes. Um, Sean kindly came over and trained uh, one of our team. And just last week we had, um, a f oh, two weeks ago we had our first proper ox cut ride right, for a village fate. And they were all very happy, even though it was pouring with rain, they were, they were, they were thrilled. So, yes, that will increase in time. I mean, our, our view is that the whole, the whole herd is an important part of the economics of the village, right? So, be it mob grazing and manure facilities, or using the oxen on the land, or using, utilizing the oxen. You know, sometimes uh, this is one of the areas where vegans on the extreme right are not so happy, but uh, we know that the animals are happier when they're utilized and they feel that they're part of something. So. One of our aspirations is also, at least, I mean, luckily right now we are we have a piece of land and beside that there's an area which is a sort of an old station industrial unit. So our barn is on there, we have electricity and we have water and everything. So we're able to process our milk and reach the, the, the legal standards that are necessary. But my aspiration is that the farm remains off the grid and one of my aspirations is also that we start looking at a whole area of treadmills with our oxen. I know that the Amish community have run their dairy farms with horsepower. And you know, I would love one day that we were able to reflect something of the similar thing with our dairy with oxen. Oh, why are you not having Gunzi cows? Because I heard they are also eating milk. So Gunzi? Oh Gunzi? We looked into Gunzi cows, we tried, we didn't find the right um, things. I've also understood that Gunzi cows may, may not always be the most robust for oxen. But um, I tried for a long time to get, before we, we had somebody from Hungary actually who was with us for a while and he, he identified Brown Swiss as the best. But then we looked for Guernsey when we couldn't find Brown Swiss and we just didn't find anyone. And so we, we went back to Brown Swiss. So Brown Swiss is also eight of milk. Yes. You get, with all of these cows you can get mix. So you just always have to test and now we know which cows are which and we're, we're sort of managing our, our herd accordingly. Yes. <clears throat> Could you say something more about nano dairies and that plan for expansion in the future? My greatest fear, I mean, we get constantly asked, people want to start a dairy and, you know, in different places. And, and we have one very good supporter, and she's writing a book and she wants to push us to get something out. And I have a reservation because. Although we've been doing this a number of years, I still have a reservation because I've seen others try and fail. So, when we went to this conference where they were talking about micro dairies and nano dairies, the whole idea of small nano dairies 
and then you know those that work could help them to work, and then grow them into small villages, and then do it into micro dairies, rather than go for a big. You know, we're not ready for that. You need a big, um, you know, landowner, or you need somebody like one of the Maharajas in India with huge tracts of land. If you're going to do a, a big dairy, let's go for small, step by step, and and, and learn uh, and grow. So that's that's sort of where where I'm coming from. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, just, I would just say that for me, the biggest risk is retirement rather than the milking. You, you'll find an audience for the milk. The, the bigger problem is if you undersell the milk, if there's no pension included in it. If you don't understand that if you borrow two milkers from Ahimsa, you're borrowing eight cows, right? Or, you know, in, in, this, uh, in this margin, really, five, uh, ten cows, right? So that's really important because otherwise what people do is they try and measure the value of their milk against the market and they say, well, okay, I'll charge twice the market rate. But no, you're measuring it against the actual cost of the full life cycle of those cows and all the cows that they have to support. And the retirement is then another component entirely. What if, what, so, you know, as we expand on the nano dairy piece, for me what's important is the cows that they're supporting are, we can maintain them and we can specialize in the retirement and, you know, we, we haven't even reached the costs that are going to be associated with the care of elderly cows. And, that is going to increase our costs, but that's why we're growing slowly and steadily. Yeah. I mean, this model of um, creating a Hingsa village, so um, do you think that sort of a project like here at Kurnabhavan, that we could gather together subscribers who would be subscribing to the concept of the Hingsa village, even without subscribing to producing milk you know, that, that um so we could um we could um, access ahimsa projects from other parts of the world um so that all and, hope, and hopefully create a, um, a supply chain where people who are ethically interested devotees and non-devotees could actually um, buy their produce from um, cow protectors, people who are committed to, a, to the Ahimsa ideal. And in this, in this way, then we would identify the, the kind of, we would identify the total market of potential subscribers. And then based on that, then we can plan for how many cows we can think about protecting. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think one of the key principles that, um, that we have is because we have subscribers and because we do delivery um, and because milk does require pretty quick delivery, uh, you can freeze it and it lasts a long time. Um, I can attest that I freeze mine when it comes and it lasts me weeks and weeks. Um, but uh, because of that, there's a natural constraint on how far you would go with the sort of Ahimsa produce availability. You know, for me, it should be localized and it should be deliverable. Um, but I think within the, uh, you absolutely have it exactly right. If we can get people who are interested in and find a local area that you could deliver to, then that becomes an immediate place where you're demand driven again, right? So rather than supply driven where you're desperate to get rid of whatever you have, if you're demand driven, and as you say, if you, if you could identify an area where you have an accumulation of people who want produce, then you can immediately start to fulfill that. I wasn't, I wasn't talking about supplying him some milk. I was talking about supplying um, like vegetable produce or even um, homemade clothes from projects who are committed, completely committed to the ideal of the Himsa and power protection. So that, um, you know, so that even if we're not in a position where we can um, supply milk, but we can give people the opportunity to buy products which are directly supporting the Hinsa projects. I was just wondering if, um, if you think that would be appropriate for like a project like Karinababa, where we already have quite a, a large database of people who are interested in our projects, and, and, and especially in the vegan community and in the yoga community, who are interested in buying like things, ethical products. And if they could be buying things which would directly support cow protection projects, then that would link them in um, to the future support 
of like a hairspirit kind of language. I just to yeah, no, that's what, that's what I, I, I understood that point of, about the future and the immediate. And I'm saying, I, I think it's absolutely the case. I, I'm just saying you have to understand how you deliver to them. That was the, that was the only point I was making. That, that you know, I, I'm wary of, of kind of tying it to, you know, something which has produce from some <coughs> other part of the globe. You see what I mean? Yeah, so locally produced for the second, it's, it's attractive. And that's the... You know, getting things from India, I mean, people have said to me, why don't you get ghee from India or get some of them dairy in Romania or in Africa? I said yes, but I don't think I'm ready for that. I, I, I think our purpose is to reach out to the locality and community that's here, and local is the word, you know, rather than importing from the other side of the world, because you, you straight away you undermine what you're doing because you're not living the principles that you're talking about. So you can't you can't dairy production outside. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, presentation, which is very enlightening and I think very relevant to our discussion in these two days. Uh, one question: How much are you able to supply today in terms of liters monthly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Twenty thousand liters a year. Okay, like two thousand liters a month. And for next year, we just got okay. our goal, and for next year, we'll start to follow the model that we're going to start. Okay, fantastic. Well, round of applause for the answer. for Gayatri now, it's a 15 minute break, and when we come back there's an activity about values, the mode of goodness and economy, is there such a possibility, we're going to look at that, alright, Hare Krishna.